think I've ever seen anybody look quite as happy as that. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he used to get me on his trike before I could walk, which um, shows his uh, experimental nature. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm curious to know, you know, looking at these pictures of him as a boy, I mean, when do you think the interest in food really began? I mean, was that evident when he was young? Or... Yes, I think our most memorable experiment <clears throat> was um, one that came out of this book, The Gentle, Gentle Art of Cookery. And there's a section in it which is um, from the uh, Arabian Nights, a whole meal from the Arabian <laughs> Fantastic. Nights. And uh, the recipe was for... You, you boiled eggs in a mixture of Turkish coffee, Turkish, I stress. Coffee? Turkish coffee and olive oil <laughs> for 12 hours. For 12 hours? Yes. So we thought, oh, well, we'll just do it overnight. So we put it on. Can I just ask why, why? I mean, what happens when you cook an egg in olive oil ah, and coffee for 12 yeah, hours? Yeah, well, that's the point of the story. Because when we came down in the morning, and went to look in the pan, there were no eggs there. And we happened to look up, and they were on the ceiling. And they, <laughs> they had exploded. Is, is, that, is that according to the recipe? Is that how they, is that how <laughs> they ate their eggs in Constantinople? No, you're, <laughs> they're, you're supposed to enjoy the taste of chestnuts, actually, which is what, uh, uh, <clears throat> what they end up tasting like. If you boil but them. I don't know, because <laughs> we, we didn't eat them off the ceiling. <laughs> So we are daringly going to attempt a dramatic recreation of the past. We are going to make the coffee eggs that you never tasted. But this time I'm going to be you, and you're going to be Alan. I'll be your sous chef. OK. Mix in equal proportions olive oil and Turkish coffee. And the olive oil, that's going to stop that boiling. There we go. Look at that. Put into this mixture as many eggs as are required and cook them very slowly for 12 hours at least. After a long time, the mixture penetrates the shells, makes the whites of the eggs amber colour and the yolks the colour of saffron and gives to them a flavour of chestnuts. So here we are, 12 hours later. Not really. <laughs> here are some that, in the time-honoured traditions of food on TV, we prepared earlier. Do you think we dare? I think we've got to. Hasn't that come up beautiful? How many years later? Oh, 50, um, 50, 50 years after the original experiment? Yes, at least. You're finally <laughs> going to taste the <laughs> result of the great quest. Rather good. It's very good. Mm, nothing like chestnuts. <laughs> no, that's what I thought. I just I wanted to hear it from you. I think that cooking the eggs of the Arabian Nights was the young Alan's way of trying to taste ancient Constantinople. Food as a way of entering other worlds, as it would be in the Oxford Companion. The exotic and the ancient fascinated him from the start. He won a scholarship to read classics at Oxford, he served in the Royal Navy in World War II and then went into the Foreign Office, a career synonymous with travel to far-off places. He met his wife, Jane, when he was posted to Washington, D.C. in 1950, and in the years that followed, they had three daughters, Caroline, Pamela and Jennifer. Postings to America, the Netherlands and Egypt satisfied his curiosity about other cultures but there was no real outlet for his love of writing and research, and that's where food came in. The first stirrings of what would become Alan's lifelong obsession came in the early 1960s, when the young diplomat and his family were living in Tunis. And before long, Alan was embarking on his first self-published book, all prompted by a little local difficulty involving his wife, Jane. Tell me, I've seen that on, on the top here, you've got a mm. book about sea fish of Tunisia. Yes. Tell this... me about that. That's by Alan. Yes, uh, this was his first writing on food, really. Um, when they were living there, uh, Jane said to him, 
look, you know, I go to the market to buy fish and there seem to be about 10 fish with the same name and um, <clears throat> 10 names for one fish. Um, can you make me a list? So since he was a, a very uh, <clears throat> thorough man, um, you'll see here this handbook giving the names of 144 species in five languages. You, you are joking. But yeah, there it is. Helen's wife goes to the market and says, I can't understand the Tunisian words for fish. And so he writes a whole book for her. Yes, that's right. And he threw in a that's few incredible. recipes from uh, people he'd met there. So this was Alan's sort of first step to yes. fish writing stardom. Yes, well, I was full of gloom about this idea because I was in publishing, but I think I thought in rather conventional terms. And I said, oh, no, people are interested in fish, they won't want all the food bit, and people are interested in fish cookery, they don't want all this stuff about, you know, the species and the, the scientific bits. What I hadn't realised was he'd actually created a new genre. Sea urchin. Inside the more or less spherical test, there is little edible matter. In fact, nothing but the five orange or rose-coloured ovaries, also known as corals. These are revealed by cutting the sea urchin open horizontally. The corals, which need no cooking, make a delicious mouthful with no accompaniment save a drop of lemon juice. Writing was also Davidson's escape from his diplomatic life, which increasingly alienated him. He was posted to Brussels in 1968, and while he was there, he wrote an agitprop novel called Something Quite Big, about heroic eco-terrorists who kidnap an entire committee of NATO officials to make the world a better place. The Foreign Office banned him from publishing it, but he had it printed anyway. 60s radicalism had reached fever pitch. Rebellion was in the air. Davidson still wore a suit, but inside he was a free thinker and a non-conformist with growing ecological concerns. Well, I think the real tipping point, the moment when Alan Davidson, the civil servant, became Alan Davidson, the food writer, well, that took place when he got posted to Laos in Southeast Asia. And I feel that if I can understand what happened to him there, then I'll really get to know why and how he became the man who could write the Oxford Companion. So that's where I'm off to now. Alan Davidson went to Laos as a newly promoted British ambassador and he was clearly delighted by his most exotic posting to date. The country we were sent to, Laos, uh, is a very remote one with uh, wonderful scenery. I remember drawing a contrast between the scene I had left in Whitehall where you had uh, sort of pale, anxious-looking people scurrying up and down corridors. And then Laos, where the sun is shining. And these beautiful, beautiful people with golden skins are moving tranquilly around, smiling and taking everything in their stride. It was just, you know, another world, and it was one that I wanted to be in. I've come to Vientiane, capital of Laos. When Alan Davidson was here, these streets ran alongside paddy fields. Now it's a bit more of an urban jungle, but you can still sense why he thought he'd been dispatched to paradise. Even his former residence feels serene. Shortly before arriving here as British ambassador, Davidson had become, at last, a published author. The famous food writer, Elizabeth David, had passed a copy of his original self-published Sea Fish of Tunisia to Penguin Books, who'd brought out an expanded edition under the title Mediterranean Seafood. The book was a great success and it inspired him to embark on another project, Fish and Fish Dishes of Laos, which is this book. And it's how he came to meet a long-term collaborator, Soon Vanitone, who made these beautiful illustrations for the book and who would also illustrate the Oxford Companion to Food. <laughs> 